They say the eyes are the windows to the soul. But what of these eyes and these souls? Next, we'll see just what it took for these cats to earn their stripes. And spots. And show how one lady is using dogs to save cats. And then head to Kenya for an up-close encounter with lions on foot. This lion is looking at me right in the eyes. From pumas to panthers, cats are some of the most intriguing creatures to walk the earth. Intelligent, powerful, beautiful, and quite deadly. If you've ever gotten up close to a big cat, you know there's a definite mystique surrounding them. Plus, they can be pretty intimidating. Solid and muscular, these creatures can weigh up to 675 pounds and grow to nine and a half feet in length. Now, add to that grace, stealth, and speed, and you've got one of the most effective killing machines on the planet. So why then are these predators vanishing at such staggering rates? That's the mystery we intend to investigate in Saving a Species, The Story of Cats. Hi everyone, I'm Julie Scardina, SeaWorld and Bush Gardens Animal Ambassador. And there's definitely something about big cats that makes me stop and take notice. Their mere size, strength, stealth, and beauty are all things that command attention. I mean, who wouldn't be in awe of such amazing creatures? Which is why it's surprising that so many big cats are in danger of becoming extinct. At current rates of decline, most of the 37 species of wild cats in the world could go extinct within the next 25 years. And what can keep that from happening? Becoming aware, at least as a first step. And rescued animals like Jasmine here, as well as the other cat ambassadors you'll meet today, can all help in creating awareness about wildlife in peril. But we're jumping ahead of ourselves. Before we talk about conservation, let's find out a little bit about the family of cats. And for that, we need to go back, way back. All modern cat species have evolved from a common ancestry that can be traced back more than two million years. But their ancestors go back even further. The cat's most ancient known ancestor lived about 40 million years ago, and it looks sort of like a weasel. The best known of the prehistoric cats is probably the saber tooth. About the size of a modern African lion, this fierce animal hunted throughout much of the world, but became extinct about 11,000 years ago. Okay, those were the prehistoric cats, but many centuries went by before the cats we know today hit the scene or became domesticated. And when they did, they played a big part in human culture and mythology for thousands of years. For centuries, big cats have been revered. Look at the Great Sphinx. It has the head of a pharaoh and the body of a lion. And the tiger has figured widely in the art and culture of the great civilizations of Asia. And then, of course, there's the house cat, like Fifi here. The domestication process started as early as 3000 BC in ancient Egypt, where cats were regarded as members of the household. There, cats were considered so valuable that the penalty for killing one was death. Cats were valued in other parts of the world as well, mostly for their rat catching skills. The ancient Greeks and Romans took cats to all other parts of Europe, and it was those early cats that actually were the ancestors of today's modern house cat. But throughout history, not everyone has been so fond of cats. Their extraordinary hunting skills, beautiful coats, and supposed healing powers have made them targets themselves for poachers, ranchers, and farmers. Today, cats are still suffering from two major problems, illegal hunting and habitat loss. Some subspecies are already extinct, and others are on the brink. We've seen that they descended from the first ancient cats who roamed the planet 40 million years ago. That common ancestry is what leaves cats with the same basic similarities. All cats are carnivores, or meat eaters, and members of the family Felidae. But over time, cats have evolved into different shapes, sizes, and colors. Through evolutionary adaptation, market differences now distinguish one species from another. Those built for speed over land, and others designed for climbing in the trees. Those who hunt by day, and those who are generally nocturnal. In fact, 37 species of wildcats now inhabit the Earth and are found on every continent except Antarctica and Australia. Those considered big cats are in the genus Panthera, which consists of tigers, 
the largest member of the cat family, lions, leopards, and jaguars. Cheetahs are the fastest land mammal on the planet. They can reach speeds of 70 miles per hour for short bursts, but long enough to track down their prey. That's faster than most roller coasters. Then there are the cats in the genus Felis. Although not considered big cats, these cats are still large and consist of pumas, also known as cougars, panthers, or mountain lions, ocelots, lynx, servals, and fishing cat. Cats of the forest, like tigers, leopards, and jaguars, are usually stockier and have much shorter limbs made for climbing. While those found in wide open savannas, such as lions and cheetahs, are longer limbed, built for running. And did you know that all cats can purr? But only four can roar. The lion, leopard, tiger, and jaguar. But there's something all cats have in common. They're extraordinary hunters with big appetites. The Siberian tiger, for instance, needs about 20 pounds of food every day to survive. At one meal, he can consume up to 100 pounds of meat since he doesn't often get to eat every day. That's because 90% of hunts are unsuccessful. Predation is hard work. With few exceptions, cats are solitary hunters who use their terrific senses of eyesight and hearing to track down their prey. They have strong limbs, sharp claws, and most, like Jasmine here, have long tails. Two features often help them stalk their prey. Patterned fur that helps them blend in with their surroundings and the ability to creep silently through their habitat. And when they strike, watch out. Big cats are big jumpers. Did you know that tigers can make horizontal leaps of 33 feet? And some leopards can jump more than 10 feet high? Cats really are the perfect hunter and well equipped for the job. Sharp teeth, strong jaws, keen hearing, remarkable vision, muscular bodies and agile limbs with powerful retractable claws, except for cheetahs, which are used for climbing, lunging, killing, and even scratching. Tiger scratch marks on trees serve as territorial markers. Some can even swim and go fishing. Even the coat of each species is specialized for the hunt. Spots, stripes, light and dark. This camouflage pelt helps cats sneak up on their prey. Leopards are differentiated from all other cats by the rosette-shaped markings on their bodies. Then there's the tiger's coat, orange with vertical black stripes. Those stripes are like human fingerprints. No two tigers have the same stripe pattern. They'll hide in dense brush and stalk their prey from behind, ambush style. But they're also expert swimmers. Tigers like the Sumatran seem willing to hunt just about anything, from fish and crocodiles to wild pigs and deer. Tigers hunt at dusk, and they travel as many as 20 miles in a single night. That means extraordinary strength, stamina, and of course, night vision. That's right. Cats can see up to six times better than we do in the dark. So it doesn't take headlights for these guys to cruise at night. Well, now that we've found out something about some of the wild cats that are out there, let's take a closer look at some of the species who are really in need and who's stepping up to come to the rescue. Some people are drawn to do the tough jobs. And this is the case with Dr. Lori Marker, founder of the Cheetah Conservation Fund. Based in Namibia, CCF's International Research and Education Center is recognized for its excellence in helping cheetahs and their habitats. And with less than 15,000 cheetahs remaining worldwide, they are in dire need of protection. The Cheetah Conservation Fund has as a mission to ensure the future survival of the cheetah using integrated approaches in conservation, education, and research. We are multidisciplined in the work that we do and try to work on a lot of levels. And we're working to try to save the cheetah, both here in Namibia, but throughout its entire range. 
CCF's current work involves examinations, including blood and tissue samples, to gain information into the animal's medical status, which can shed light on diseases that affect this species. Data on their range, habitat use, and habits are collected from past radio tracking studies, which gives insight into exactly what cheetahs do with their days. Many things are threatening the cheetah population. One factor impacting them is hunting and trapping by regional farmers. Cheetahs are stealthy, swift hunters, and captive farm animals make an easy target, especially when native prey are becoming more and more scarce due to farming and ranching in once wild lands. Livestock are the farmer's source of income, which comes down to his own survival. So CCF has launched an ambitious educational campaign geared toward the local farmers and has worked directly with them to respond to their needs while sparing the lives of the cheetahs. One innovative solution has been to breed dogs, specifically Anatolian shepherds, and place them with farmers to guard their stock. In addition to training, CCF provides free medical care for the dogs, trains the animals, and teaches the farmers how to provide the best dog care and support. To date, nearly 200 Anatolian Shepherds have been placed as livestock guardians and have had a dramatic impact on reducing the number of wild cheetahs trapped and killed in Namibia. But not all cheetah conservation is being done overseas. For over 25 years, White Oak Conservation Center in Florida has been involved in research, rehabilitation, and conservation of a variety of animals and their habitats. From the rare oak hoppy to an assortment of African hoofstock, this Florida preserve has made a mark in wildlife conservation. Basically, we're working with uh, threatened and endangered species to provide options for the future. You know, there's just different opportunities for different species we have here. Each has a strategic plan that's worked out, dedicated what we're going to concentrate on, either research, breeding, conservation, reintroduction. So we look at all those different components. Partnering with a range of notable organizations, White Oak also joined forces with the Cheetah Conservation Fund. Their mission? Stabilize the cheetah gene pool and bolster the population numbers. The cheetah is, is hard to study in the wild. You know, it's a solitary animal and the mother hides the young. By having them where we can look at them and monitor them and we, we've learned a lot about their basic needs, we try to provide a linkage between the species we have here and the species in the wild. And the chance of these cheetahs going back to the wild are very, are very slim, but the knowledge we're, we're gathering here does help generate uh, enthusiasm, support for CCF. A lot of information can be gathered about the cheetahs during this time, which can teach us how best to meet the needs of this species. There's a lot of uh, research that we do here at White Oak because of the number of animals that we have. We do veterinary research so that we look at some disease issues. We do reproductive physiology research and we do behavioral research. And we can use that information to go back and see if we can help with any of the problems that they're having in the native habitats in Africa. When the cheetahs reach a stable age, some are relocated to other facilities. Every cub that's born, we look at within a two-year period trying to place them into another zoological institution. The Cheetah Species Survival Plan sets up so that we can look at the genetics of all the individual animals and then we'll have a better idea of who should be breeding with whom and who shouldn't be breeding with whom, which is very important as well. White Oak's partnership with the Cheetah Conservation Fund has proven to be a successful merger and has served the cheetah conservation effort on many levels. But White Oak has been successful with another cat species as well, right in their own backyard. The White Oak Conservation Center began its uh, work in rehabbing uh, Florida panthers in 1986 with the arrival of a male named Big Guy who had been hit by a car and was seriously injured. Panthers that have been orphaned or injured in the wild are brought to White Oak where they are treated medically until fit. The Florida panther is highly endangered, with less than 100 animals left in the wild. With numbers this low, the gene pool is limited, affecting the reproductive health of the population. Habitat loss due to building development and deaths due to car accidents have had a severe impact on the panthers as well. Since every individual cat is so important to the population, uh, those cats are brought here with the hope of, of salvaging them and getting them back out into the wild. And we do whatever we can do to, to make sure that that happens. Then they're released into a 17-acre heavily wooded enclosure where they are allowed to build up their stamina. During this time, their progress is monitored by video cameras 
to ensure the panthers can find prey and support themselves. After several months of rehab, the panthers are returned to their home range in South Florida. A couple of years ago, we, we had a cat in here uh, that went through 72 surgeries in order to repair its uh, one of its legs. It had been broken in, a, in an accident with a car. And uh, we finally got him back in, in sound condition. He was released, and uh, since then, he has uh, sired at least two litters of offspring that we know of. So apparently, his leg's holding up well, and uh, everything's uh, working as it should be. Uh, the news just doesn't get any better than that. Bush Gardens and SeaWorld are active supporters of the Florida Panther. In connection with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, they are working towards management of the feline leukemia virus. Information gained from this research will not only help manage the outbreak in the Florida Panther, it will also benefit managers of other wildcat populations. Florida isn't the only place where panthers are found. Out west, where they're also known as cougars or mountain lions, this cat faces its own set of challenges. Once upon a time, cougars lived all over the American wilderness, boasting the most extensive distribution of any non-human land mammal in the Western Hemisphere. Secretive and solitary, the cougar is rarely seen by humans, though its distinctive call can be heard for miles. East of the Mississippi, however, cougars are generally presumed extinct. As we just saw, only one subspecies survives in the east, the endangered Florida panther. Until the mid-1900s, cougars in the West faced the same predator control pressures that wiped them out of the East, with most states paying bounties for killing cougars. But by the 1960s, public perception had begun to change, and many Western states eliminated bounties and placed limits on cougar hunting. Some states have even stronger protection for cougars. California, for instance, banned cougar hunting entirely in 1990. So cougars in the West have fared much better than their eastern counterparts, due largely to vast public lands that support the cats and their prey. But as long as expanding human activities continue to encroach upon their remaining strongholds, the future of this cat will remain uncertain. Have you noticed a recurring theme yet? In order to save the cats, two main points keep popping up. One, protect their habitat, and two, educate people about the important role of predators in the environment. As a conservationist, I sometimes wonder why I'm making the world safer for goats, but if you're interested in predator conservation, you have to be interested in livestock conservation because people kill predators when predators kill livestock. If we want to make the world safe for hyenas and lions, we need to help protect these livestock better. Dr. Lawrence Frank knows his predators. As head of the Lycipia Predator Project at the Impala Research Center in Kenya, he is a champion in the efforts of livestock management. So what does livestock management have to do with lions? Well, in the past decade, lion populations have been drastically reduced, mostly due to poisoning and shooting of these predators. Native tribes people have been protecting their livestock for centuries. In the past, there was plenty of prey for lions to hunt, which meant they were less likely to kill livestock. But human population growth and habitat loss has made for poorer conditions and tougher times for predators. With less space and fewer prey, lions are more prone to attack livestock, and local tribes people have resorted to aggressive measures to protect their herds. The Predator Project takes action by tagging and tracking lions in the region in order to keep tabs on their movements and to identify problem lions that repeatedly attack livestock. Dr. Frank's use of GPS makes this process very effective. In order to find our lions, to figure out where they're going, how they're using the land in relation to people and livestock, the only way we can do that is to radio collar them and track them from the air. Bush Gardens has long supported Dr. Frank's research, and I was lucky enough to be able to track lions with Dr. Frank in Africa, in person. Hey, Dr. Frank. Hey, Julie. How, are How you? was your flight this morning? It was pretty good. What'd you find? I uh, found number 50 and 51, which are a pair of females. 
we've seen them from the air a little while ago and they had a couple of animals I didn't recognize with them. They're not far from here. I thought maybe late this afternoon we'd take a walk and see if we can lay eyes on them. Oh, that would be awesome. It, it might get interesting. I can't wait. Let's do it. <laughs> Easier said than done. We trekked through bush and across open savanna, following the beep of the portable tracking device, while Dr. Frank tried to lure them with a distressed animal collar. But no luck in spotting Lion 50 or 51. We decided to move deeper into the bush, which eventually paid off. This lion is no more than 15 yards from us, looking at me right in the eyes, yeah. I swear. Well, let me tell you, summoning a lion to within 50 feet of you is not for the faint of heart. They're stealthy, unpredictable, and, well, remember that distressed animal caller? These cats were expecting dinner. These females are really wary. That's as much as we've ever seen of them. She was a little bit upset, wasn't she? Yeah, wow. yeah. The last time we did this, she charged us. A better understanding of how these lions move within their range and gaining insight into how they hunt has helped Dr. Frank find real solutions to livestock predation. The Predator Project offers local farmers viable alternatives to killing lions, such as providing stronger gates on their bomas or corrals, or installing solar-powered electric fences to fend off predators while keeping their livestock and homes safe. Cat conservation is a complex puzzle involving a lot of pieces and many players. Finding answers may not be easy, but with dedicated people and programs, entire communities understand that they can have an impact on the future of a species. On La Kippia Plateau, numbers 50 and 51 have Dr. Frank and the Predator Project to thank for that. have long been hunted and killed for all kinds of reasons. They are killed because they're seen as competitors for prey. They are killed because they've taken livestock. They're killed to clear land for development. They're killed for sport. They're killed for the fashion trade. And they're even killed for their body parts, used for health remedies in some countries. The loss of cat habitat has reached dangerous levels as the human population continues to soar. You know what? Their problem is also our problem. The decline of a carnivore, such as a cat, changes the entire balance of an ecosystem. Let's take a look. Cats are linked to their prey, who in turn are linked to one another through competition for food. Changes in this food chain directly affect our environment, which means this directly affects us. And none of the big cats are safe, not even the biggest feline of all. Some experts say the Sumatran tiger could be the first large mammal to go extinct in the 21st century. Tigers once roamed from Russia to the Indian Ocean and across the Far East, but are now only found in small pockets of Asia. Three of the original eight tiger subspecies, the Bali, Javan, and Caspian, have become extinct in the past 70 years. And the five remaining subspecies, the Bengal, Sumatran, Amur, or Siberian, Indo-Chinese and South China are all threatened by poaching and habitat loss. The total wild population of these remaining tiger subspecies has been estimated to be as few as 5,000. World Wildlife Fund is making a difference. They're making extreme efforts to preserve the tiger's habitat and implement anti-poaching patrols throughout Asia. Rangers remove snares and traps from designated parks, and suspects are taken into custody for police investigation. World Wildlife Fund field officers followed up on arrests, monitor progress of investigations, and draw media attention to pressure courts to act responsibly in sentencing. 
Since 2001, Bush Gardens and SeaWorld have contributed over $100,000 to World Wildlife Fund's tiger conservation efforts, and this important partnership will definitely continue. There's only five of eight tiger subspecies existing still in the wild, and SeaWorld Bush Gardens Conservation Fund is helping World Wildlife Fund to protect them. If you take the Sumatran tiger, for example, um, that lives on the island of Sumatra in Indonesia, there are only 400 of these animals left in the wild. And Sumatra, the island that they live on um, in Indonesia, is home to the most threatened rainforest on Earth. So SeaWorld Bush Gardens Conservation Fund is supporting World Wildlife Fund to do real work in real places and achieve real results in tiger conservation. So what else can be done to help preserve cats and their habitats? To begin with, the habitats where cats live must be preserved. Laws that protect cat species and their prey must be passed and enforced. Ways need to be found to meet the needs of cats and humans, especially in areas where farming, ranching, and human settlements are moving into cat habitats. It's also important to support breeding programs in zoological parks to maintain a gene pool that can help wild populations when needed. Some people feel these animals can be kept as pets, which is never a good idea. You know, wild animals as pets never work out. Uh, we have two facilities full of them to prove that theory. People see some animal that they think is really cool, and instead of expressing their love by uh, helping that animal, they, they think to themselves, I want to own it. And then they find a way, usually against the law, to bring one of these critters into their house and figure out real quick that these animals belong in the wild. Bush Gardens recently became home to two rescued tiger cubs. The two orange tigers were actually a rescued animal from a private owner. They were in good condition and they were about 12 weeks old when they came in. We actually took them down to the nursery. It took a lot of time. We actually had to come in um, in the middle of the night and bottle feed them. And when they were about a year old, we actually um, introduced them to our white tigers. So then what can you do? How can you help cats bounce back from their population lows, protect them in the wild, and give them hope for the future? There's actually a lot you can do from wherever you are. A major threat to cats is the loss of their habitat through deforestation. So buy recycled paper. Stay informed and spread the word about why big cats are so cool and why they're in trouble. World Wildlife Fund announced their most recent Pennies for the Planet campaign, which is an educational and fundraising program that gets kids involved hands-on in conservation. Their 2005 focus is big cats, so check out their website and download their newsletter. Here's something else. Don't buy medicines, trinkets, or skins of wild cats, or things made from resources found in their habitats. Get to know how your buying habits impact the environment around the globe, and remember, Education can make a huge difference. This facility in California, Zoo to You, is a nonprofit organization that teaches kids of all ages about wildlife and the environment. Zoo to You is also a cat refuge, helping to teach people about the plight of these magnificent creatures. We've looked at several organizations coming together in the name of cat conservation. Pick one and get behind their cause. There are so many ways to support conservation, and you know, Anyone, anywhere can get involved. They say that cats have nine lives. Well, if that's true, then most of the world's big cat species are probably on number nine already. The extinction of wildcats would be a tremendous loss to the world. The importance of their ecological role as predators is huge, and it's essential that we make every effort to prevent that from happening. After all, it's the human race that's responsible for their decline, and it's humans who can save them. Humans like you and me. From SeaWorld and Bush Gardens, I'm Julie Scardina. Thanks for watching The Cat Story. Hi, I'm Jenny Bush, Conservation Ambassador for the Anheuser-Busch Adventure Parks. SeaWorld, Bush Gardens, and Discovery Cove are dedicated to the conservation and preservation of wildlife. And we believe the stories like the one you just experienced need to be told. The cats featured in this program are just a few of the many species that benefit from the SeaWorld and Bush Gardens Conservation Fund, a nonprofit charitable organization dedicated to animal rescue, wildlife research, habitat protection, and conservation education. Your support to the continued viewing of programs like this is appreciated. I encourage you to learn all you can about animals and their environment. Remember, we're all interconnected. What happens to them eventually happens to us. So we need to protect them and their habitats. Together, 
we can make a difference.